everyone. Um, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Diane Stockton um, and I am um, one of the uh, social and system recovery leads at Public Health Scotland. I'd like to welcome you to the FINS 2020 seminar series. Um, so FINS um, is the Public Health Information Network for Scotland and it's 20 years now that we've had um, FINS seminars and this is our first virtual seminar series. Um, so over the years these have been organised by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and Public Health Scotland as part of the SCOPFO collaboration. Um, so for this year there are three separate but linked online webinars <coughs> focusing on the impact, um, the context and the emergence from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So um, uh, welcome to this one and hopefully some of you are at the, at the previous one. If you're tweeting about the, the webinar, please use hashtag FINS2020, P-H-I-N-S 2020. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and after the event you'll have access to both the recording and copies of the presentation slides and they'll all be on the SCOCFO website and you'll get an email to, um, to give you that link. Um, so please, uh, so please do, do note that. So we're going to start with two 20 minute presentations um, and then we'll have a 15 minute Q&A. Now if you want to ask a question, you can post your questions at any time. Uh, please post them in the Q&A function. So if you look along your bar, uh, which on my screens at the bottom, there's a Q&A function and a chat function. Please use the Q&A function for questions and please feel free to post them at any point um, during the presentations. And then I will select questions in the final session to put to the speakers because I'm assuming we'll have lots of questions and we won't be able to get, get through them all. So I'd like to start off by welcoming David Walsh. Um, he's a public health programme manager at the Glasgow Centre for Population Health and he's responsible for leading a number of different research programmes with health inequalities and the determinants as a key focus of his work. So welcome David uh, and I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Uh, there we go. We can all see that, can we? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yes, uh, welcome Zoomers uh, of the world. Uh, we were just saying before you joined us that it's uh, uh, always a very weird way to present this, you're presenting into the void basically. So I, I can't see anybody's reactions, I have no idea if you're looking excited and interested in what I'm going to say or if you're sitting in your pyjamas having a bit of a scratch doing a crossword or whatever. So uh, it's all a little bit weird. For my own sanity I'm going to assume that you're very interested in what I'm going to talk about which is about pre-pandemic mortality trends across the UK as you see on the screen. Now given this is a series of webinars about the pandemic, you might want to ask whether pre-pandemic trends really matter. And I'm going to argue that they matter massively for a whole number of different reasons. Uh, the first being, that, as it says on the slides, that we were in a crisis before this crisis. And I'll try and show you that. Uh, the second is that you need to understand that to understand the scale of pandemic inequalities that have been much publicised in the news. And the third is that uh, you need to understand it in the relation to coming out of the pandemic. And so uh, with talk of building back better, we need to, to know where we were to start with. Uh, and as I'm going to show you, I don't think we were in a very good place. So yeah, quite an uplifting presentation. Uh, there's going to be quite a lot of uh, charts and data, but I'm going to run through them quite quickly. So hopefully it won't be too painful if that's not uh, your thing. Okay, so uh, if I click on this, this should work. Here we go. So. In terms of the background to this project, uh, well for the background you have to use your uh, memory or if that's failing your imagination and either remember or um, imagine a time where if you went say on the BBC News website there were actually other stories than just wall-to-wall -wall pandemic stories and uh, a year or two ago there was lots of stories like this about the stalling and improvement in life expectancy. Now I think if you don't work in public health to many people that didn't really mean a great deal, uh, but if you do work in public health uh, then it was ringing all sorts of alarm bells because basically this shouldn't happen. In wealthy societies, the UK, Scotland, this shouldn't be happening. So the aim of this project was really to look at these changing mortality trends both at country and because we had the data at city level. 
So uh, we were looking at the four nations of the UK and then um, 11 cities across the UK that you see in, on your screen. So uh, the four largest in Scotland, the six largest in England, apart from London, because it's a bit of a basket case compatibility wise, and also Belfast in Northern Ireland. And we were looking not at life expectancy, but uh, uh, um, at mortality rates um, for all cause deaths and uh, a broad set of individual causes that again you see on your screen and you'll also see as we go through some of the presentation. And we were looking at trends over about 35 to 40 years. It varies a little bit in terms of different countries and their data sets and analysing by sex, a broad set of age groups and importantly by deprivation over a shorter time period using the different national deprivation indices of the countries. And for the Scottish cities, we're also doing um, analysis by city specific quintiles of deprivation to give a more detailed insight into urban inequalities in those cities. What does all that result in? It results in a ludicrous number of analysis uh, and the risk for you as an audience of a, a kind of death by data PowerPoint experience. Um, so to overcome that, I'm just going to try and summarize um, the, the main points that came out of it in a very a very quick 10 minute rapid overview. And I've summarized them under four main headings. So the first set of the results from all these analysis that I want to talk about is that these recent changes in mortality, this slowdown and improvement, stalling and improvement is seen everywhere in the UK. And that's a really important point. This isn't just about Scotland. So if we look at, for example, um, this is uh, females of all ages uh, in Scotland and long-term improvement in mortality trends over time, we see here the change in, in the trend in the most recent period. But the most important point is that the trend in England and Wales is exactly the same as it is in Northern Ireland, suggesting therefore common root cause. If I just put that to one side, I'll show you in a second similar trends for cities. Now cities are obviously smaller, smaller population size, uh, fewer numbers of deaths. So we are more likely to get a lot of kind of fluctuation in rates over time, which can make it a bit more uh, difficult to interpret. Nonetheless, if you look at the six English cities, you do still get this sense of a change in the most recent period with a leveling off in these uh, rates. If you look at Belfast, you're certainly seeing that. In Scotland, uh, you see it for Glasgow in blue at the top. Uh, the other cities is a, a bit of fluctuation, so we'll come back to that in a second. Um, in terms of males, it's basically the same story. This change in rates in the most recent period with this levelling off at the country level. At the city level, the suggestion of that across some of the English cities, um, clearly seeing it in Belfast. And then again, for the Scottish cities, well, maybe in Glasgow, but again, there's a lot of fluctuation there. So because of that fluctuation, it becomes quite important to try and quantify this change over time rather than just relying on eyeballing line charts. Um, and I've done that very simply just by looking at the percentage change in rates between five year blocks. So how much have rates changed between, say, 1981 or the period around 81 and 1985 or the period around 85? How much between 86 and 90, 91, 95, etc., to give a more robust view of, of change over time? And if you do that at the country level, first of all, then, then what you see is, is this continual improvement across the different countries through the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, until this most recent period where things have stopped improving. And that's basically what you saw in the first chart I showed you, because this is for, for females of all ages. And for males of all ages, it's basically the same picture. There you go. Improvement, 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 and then really not very much improvement. But the point of doing this is, is obviously to see uh, to aid interpretation of the charts for the cities. So if we look at the Scottish cities and, and we'll add Belfast in just to group them together, then that's basically what you're seeing for males, the same picture of improvement through time, through these decades, and then no improvement or indeed potentially um, a worsening of some rates. This is males. The picture for females is broadly similar with this change in rates in the most recent period. And across the different English cities, again, broadly, it's the same pattern of improvement, 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 and then less improvement, albeit for males, uh, Sheffield in blue and Bristol in green seem to be slightly less affected. But for females, they are affected. And again, you see this clear change in rates in the last period. Now, all of this is for all ages. I want to very, very quickly just mention premature deaths, deaths under the age of 65, because it's a very important topic for health research in Scotland. 
And the trends there are basically very similar to what I've shown you, but rather than a leveling off in the most recent period in Scotland, we actually see a worsening in mortality rates, increasing in mortality rates. And that's uh, linked to the influence of drug related deaths I'm going to pick up at the end of the presentation. But that issue aside, we also see quite worrying trends that I'll show you for Dundee. So very quickly, um, at the country level, this is what I've just said, England and Wales, there's levelling off of rates in the most recent period, but in Scotland actually an increase uh, quantified in the graph next to it there. This is males and then for females, broadly the same picture. And in terms of the cities, uh, again, quite a bit of fluctuation, but this is the trend I'm talking about for Dundee with this sharp increase in mortality rates in the most recent period. And it goes without saying that in a... Uh, a major city of a wealthy country, uh, this basically shouldn't be happening. We shouldn't be seeing this in our society. So that's the first set of results, uh, just emphasizing that these changes are happening everywhere. The second thing I want to say is that this slowdown or this stalling of improvement, what it's actually doing is masking increasing death rates among the poorest in society. And again, this shouldn't be happening either. And this is also happening across uh, the UK. So we'll go back to this chart showing uh, female mortality rates in Scotland and this change in the trend in the most recent period. This is not driven by uh, people living in the least deprived areas. This is people in the 20% least deprived neighbourhoods. What it is driven is by people living in the 20% most deprived neighbourhoods where mortality rates have been going up. And again, this just, just shouldn't happen. And it's worth just emphasising this is not the 1% most deprived or the 5% most deprived, it's the 20% most de deprived. So we're looking at a fifth of the population. Importantly, if I put that graph just to one slide, uh, one side, the picture for England is exactly the same with this increasing death rate among the most deprived. It's also the same in Northern Ireland and if we look at males we're seeing the same thing in Scotland, increasing death rates among the poorest in England, uh, again in Northern Ireland to a degree and then in the cities we see in Glasgow a previously declining trend among the city's most deprived areas, now increasing death rates, also in Edinburgh increasing death rates and although a lot of fluctuation in Aberdeen basically in the, in, in the last period the same thing. And again, in Dundee, increasing death rates among the poorest. This, again, is, is deaths at all ages. Uh, very quickly mentioned premature deaths, where the story is basically the same, but worse in terms of the, these increasing death rates in the most uh, recent period for Scotland. There's Glasgow, Aberdeen. And this is the trend I showed a minute ago in Dundee, uh, with this increase uh, overall for under 65 deaths. And this isn't about those living in the least deprived areas, but it's quite dramatically about those living in the most deprived areas. Now, when you see a graph like this, and there'll be one or two statos in the audience wanting to point this out, it often means it's just about small numbers, you know, small numbers causing this kind of fluctuation in rates. But actually, I would argue that in a, a, a city of Dundee's size, and we're only looking at a fifth of the population, 270 deaths in a three-year period isn't a small number, it's a, a worryingly large number. Okay, so that's the second of the four things I want to talk about. Uh, the third is that these widening inequalities uh, driven by increasing death rates among the poorest um, in the most recent period are not seen just for one or two causes of death, but actually seen for the majority of the different causes of death that we looked at. Um, I'm short of time today, obviously, so I can't go into this in detail. So if we take one example, which is again, um, uh, females of all ages in Scotland, these are the 10 different causes of death we've looked at. And the point to really note is that you're seeing widening inequalities driven by increasing death rates in the poorest areas in the most recent time period in the majority of the causes that we look at. The main exceptions are suicide for females, where the gap has narrowed a bit, and motor vehicle transport accidents, where numbers are just very small and there's an awful lot of fluctuation anywhere. But anyway, uh, but otherwise it's a widening of inequalities. And that widening of inequalities we also see for males, with the exception of uh, cancer, particularly lung cancer, where the gap has actually been narrowing rather than widening. And that relates to different historic trends in lung cancer between males and females that some of you will be aware of. Uh, just to say again that rather than just rely on uh, eyeballing these graphs, we did quantify the change in inequalities by calculating summary statistics of both 
um, absolute and relative inequalities. Given the number of graphs I'm throwing at you for everyone's sanity, I'm not going to go into detail with that, but I'll give you two quick examples just to hammer home the point. So this orange line shows for males of all ages in Scotland, relative inequality. So that's the relative gap across deprivation quintiles and mortality. And relative inequalities were already increasing. But because of these recent changes uh, in the most recent period, they've jumped up further again. Absolute inequalities, that's the absolute gap across the deprivation quintiles, have been going down for a long time. But again, because of these changes, they've also jumped up. So we're now seeing widening relative and absolute inequalities because of these changes. The other quick example is, is deaths from stroke, cerebrovascular disease, and big jumps in both relative and absolute inequalities because, again, of these changes in the most recent period. Okay, continuing at this ridiculous breakneck speed, and apologies for that, but there's quite a bit to get through. Uh, the fourth of the uh, four sets of results I want to show come under the slightly uninspiring headline of that there are various city level issues to highlight. So basically when doing the analysis, various things um, kept cropping up for individual cities and I've tried to summarise these quickly. Um, when writing this up, they were summarised under four headings. But the first two of these I've already shown you, which is that the, this change in mortality rates um, happens at city level as well. And I've shown you that already, as I have shown you that that's masking the increase in death rates among the poorest also occurring at city level. So the third of the four things is that uh, Glasgow, again, and this won't be a surprise to many of you, stands out among uh, the UK cities in terms of having the highest death rates for most causes that, that we look at. So if you look at all cause deaths, for example, um, the individual grey lines are the, the other UK cities. The big dotted line is England and Wales at the bottom. The small dotted line is Scotland. And Glasgow's always had much higher all-cause mortality rates. Uh, and we know the reasons for this, and we, we've published quite a lot on this in, this in recent years, but it's still quite a striking difference. And even more striking when you look at different causes of death, for example, alcohol-related causes. So again, the grey lines are the other cities. Uh, England and Wales at the bottom, Scotland the small dotted line. And the point of showing this is that the, the scale of alcohol related deaths uh, is just completely different in Glasgow as you see with the blue line. And although they've come down recently, uh, in the most recent period they've started to go up again. So this is another cause for concern. And the fourth and final point to make is that although Glasgow stands out in terms of having the highest rates, some exceptions do apply and these also relate to the changes in mortality in this most recent time period that we're talking about. So one example is around uh, deaths from ischemic heart disease. Um, so this again, England and Wales, Scotland, the other cities, and Scotland always had much higher rates of ischemic heart disease compared to other UK cities. But because of the changes recently, uh, you see that Manchester has now overtaken uh, Glasgow and has the highest rates. And the other exception of note relates to Dundee and drug related deaths and I want to more or less finish the presentation just talking about this in a bit more detail because it's very important. So um, we're using a definition of drug related poisonings. This is defined by diagnostic codes on death certificates and it's a broader less accurate definition than the, the official national published figures for drug related deaths but the figures are very, very similar. And they allow us to do um, a bit of in-depth analysis across different parts of the UK. And if you do that, what you see is increasing death rates just about everywhere, but the picture is quite dramatically different in Scotland, as, as many of you will be aware of. Um, it's clearly highly socially patterned, and I'll show you that. And although I'll just show you two or three charts, um, bear in mind that it's basically the same kinds of trends for all ages, for working ages, and for males and females. So uh, this first chart shows the divergence for males of all ages, the divergence of Scotland from the rest of the UK over time for uh, drug-related deaths, drug-related poisonings, including, as you see, a big jump in the most recent period that we've been talking about. Drug-related deaths, tragically, are obviously about more about deaths at younger ages. And so if you look at uh, 15 to 44 year olds, you see this quite dramatic trend, including this further jump in the most recent period. And the picture for 45 to 64 year olds is pretty similar um, in terms of these overall trends. 
At City level, um, we've done a lot of work over the years looking at Glasgow, Liverpool and Manchester and showing how similar cities they are in a number of important regards, but not in relation to drug-related deaths where the picture in Glasgow is completely different and again influenced by this big change in the most recent period. Deaths from this cause have also been going up in Belfast, as you see there, uh, but Dundee now has the highest rates because again of this big jump in the most recent period. The social patterning of drug-related deaths is very apparent. Uh, it doesn't take away the kind of shock value of this particular chart, though, in terms of the, the striking trend among those in Scotland living in the most deprived uh, quintile, including, again, this big increase most recently. And that overall picture for males is basically exactly the same for females, but just on a different scale. I'll just do that. So smaller numbers, but the same overall pattern, including this increase in the most recent period. And indeed, this increase in the most recent period among the poorest is seen within the cities. So that's the 20% uh, most deprived of Glasgow, this big, big jump. That's Edinburgh, uh, bottom left, this is Aberdeen. And really, really dramatically, this is Dundee. Now again, uh, a bit of a rustle of anoraks from a, the statues in the audience saying, well, clearly this must be small numbers. And I suppose you can say that uh, 50 odd deaths in a three year period in a statistical sense is a small number, but it's not in a human sense. And you can say the same, I think, for Aberdeen. But actually, when you get to um, Edinburgh uh, and Glasgow, these are neither small numbers in a, in a human sense or a statistical sense. I think they're actually very, very big numbers and they're very, very alarming numbers. And with that, and with that ludicrous uh, sprint through all that data, um, I'm going to kind of stop and try and summarise what I've said at breakneck speed, which is that there are a number of UK-wide issues affecting all of the UK, and this is principally about the, the slowdown in the rate of improvement in mortality, which is masking increased rates of deaths among the most disadvantaged in society, something that I've said shouldn't happen. There are also Scotland-specific issues, principally the impact of drugs harm, which is driving a worsening of overall mortality rates among the under 65s. What's causing all this? Well, we kind of know, to be honest, in terms of the drugs uh, deaths, it's a, a perfect storm of an ageing vulnerable cohort who are now encountering multiple morbidities as they age. Increased affordability, accessibility and the types of drugs on the market, um, cuts to social security and relevant services in the most recent period and lots more. And I would point you to the Scottish Affairs Committee report uh, from last year, um, which highlighted all the evidence for this and also the best recommendations for what to do about it, although those recommendations seem to have been ignored by the UK government. And in terms of the overall mortality trends, the important point is that you have to look at these in the context of all the other evidence out there, both international evidence and lots of research evidence in the UK, of the impact of austerity measures on population health, and conclude that this is further evidence of the likely impact of the UK government's austerity measures, which have been in place since 2010. And just to hammer home that point, these changing rates that I've shown you have coincided with unprecedented cuts to public spending, including truly staggering cuts to social security budgets, which clearly impacts on the most vulnerable in society. And in the words of the United Nations and Philip Alston eh, on his visit to the UK um, a couple of years ago, in high income wealthy countries like the UK, poverty is a political choice. It's not inevitable, it's a political choice. And I think what we're seeing now are the consequences of those political choices. And I think we should have been shouting about this before the pandemic. And we now need to shout an awful lot louder about it eh, to allow those voices to be heard over everything else that's going on. And at that point, I'm going to stop, eh, mention that this will hopefully be published soon and we'll publicise it when that happens and um, let you get back to your crossword or whatever you're doing. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Really important work and really important messages for the uh, for the audience here and, and everyone, obviously. Um, please do post questions for David in the Q&A box uh, and we'll pick those up at the end. Um, first of all, we're going to hear from Ruth um, and then and then we'll pick up all questions after that. So I'd just like to introduce you to Ruth. So Ruth Dundas is a senior research fellow at the University of Glasgow. And she's co-leading the Understanding Inequalities Workstream at the MRC CSO Social and Public Health Sciences Unit. 
and much of her research focuses on inequalities in mortality and the contextual and social influences on health over the life course. So welcome Ruth, we look forward to hearing uh, what you've got to tell us. Okay. Thanks Diane. Oh, I might have lost what I was supposed to be sharing. Sorry, you'd think after having six months of working on Zoom, I'd know how to operate it. There we go. Can everyone see my screen? Hopefully. Yeah, we can see that, Ruth. That's great. That's great. Thanks, Diane. Um, yeah, so thanks to Diane for the introduction. Um, FINS meetings, as David said, they're always a good opportunity to meet up, and it's a shame that we aren't able to network as usual. Um, and I'd also like to thank the organisers for inviting me to present today. So today I'm going to discuss the contrast between the UK government's response to COVID-19 with their response to health inequalities. As Diane said, I've got a long-standing interest in health inequalities and really, um, when the pandemic was starting, I was struck by the sort of immediate response and the policy interventions that were um, introduced um, to mitigate COVID-19 compared to how the governments have responded to health inequalities over the years. I'll just take you through some of the examples um, of the contrast and then pose the question, ask if the difference in response is actually justified. So I want to take you back to February and March of this year. Um, the UK and devolved governments announced many measures to protect the population from the COVID-19 pandemic and their concern at the time was that the virus will spread, it will overwhelm the NHS capacity to respond, it will reduce economic output as workers become ill and it will kill large numbers of people. Now let's consider health inequalities. We've just had 20 minutes of David telling us about inequalities are increasing and they have been increasing over many, many years. The NHS is overstretched and is dealing with illness, much of which is due to health inequalities. The economic output isn't optimal as working age people are sick and unable to work. And a recent Lancet paper from last year showed that inequalities resulted in large number of deaths. So what can governments do to address these concerns? Well, they can follow the science and take urgent and radical action. For COVID-19, that meant a multi-agency approach and interventions at the population level. What can we do about health inequalities? How can these be tackled? Well, it seems if you follow the science, a similar approach is needed. And this multi-agency approach to tackling health inequalities has been acknowledged by many and this was um, Dame Sally Davies, the Chief Medical Officer from 2011 to 2019 and she seems to indicate that the government works in departmental silos and a multi-agency approach can't be done. Here's a quote from an interview with her in the HSG in February 2020 when the Marmot Review was published. She says, there is something terribly frustrating about the Marmot approach. Poverty is at the root of it all, or poor education, he claims. Yes, so what are we going to do about that? I'm from the Department of Health. There's not much we can do about it. And now I'm going to take you through some of the specific contrasts between the response to COVID-19 and health inequalities, and then show some data about why we should be concerned about the limited response to reducing inequalities and mortality. So how timely have the responses been? Well, for COVID-19, it was immediate. On the same day that COVID-19 cases were reported in China, the UK government issued advice on travelling to Wuhan in China. And then 62 days from these cases being reported to full mitigation. So it only took 62 days before they closed the schools, non-essential business sectors were closed, and we were all told to work at home. For inequalities, the Black Report was published in 1980 and it took until 1999 before they had targeted resource allocation in NHS in England. And when that was introduced, that led to a reduction in amenable mortality over the next decade. And for non-health, they had changes to benefits and welfare policies between 1997 and 2010, and that did lead to a reduction 
in child poverty. So you can see the contrast there, immediate for COVID-19, nearly two decades to do something about inequalities. What about the volume of evidence required before the multi-agency action? Maybe there was just vast amounts of evidence for COVID-19 and not so much for around health inequalities. Well, as I said, it took 62 days of reports from the WHO detailing cases and deaths from around the world, as well as deaths and cases in the UK. For health inequalities, there's been a body of evidence from the initial Black Report in 1980, and here's just a short list of other um, key reports um, that have been um, published over the years, and there also is a, you know, a huge literature on health inequalities saying that we need to do something about it. I mean, I'd argue that although some policies have been introduced um, and shown to have limited effectiveness, the health inequalities still exist and there isn't much government response. In terms of statements, um, the WHO, the UK and devolved governments have daily briefings and from the, the daily briefings are from a range of high ranking government ministers. They also have the chief medical officers. Um, in contrast for health inequalities, the Black Report was published on August Bank Holiday and Monday and only a few copies were printed. And when Michael Marmot's most recent report on stalling life expectancy um, was published, it was the Prime Minister's spokesperson who reported promises to level up. And OK, to be fair, the Health Secretary also repeated similar sentiments, so he did come out and say something. But again, it wasn't televised live or on the radio, it was in the newspapers. And neither of these statements appear on the respective gov.uk communications pages. What about the quality of evidence? Um, well, for COVID-19, the case fatality rate in March when the UK government had its immediate response was unknown, and it could be argued that it's still unknown. There are estimates of around 1.3% for the UK, but this is likely to be an overestimate as the denominator is unknown because not everyone is tested. However, for health inequalities, all-cause mortality by deprivation uses well-described and validated measures. Um, the measures, the deprivation measures are badged as national statistics products. The numerator of the total deaths and the denominator population are also high-quality measures coming from ONS and NRS. And there's also a contrast in the language that's used. For COVID-19, they convene the COBRA committee and they have meet meetings of SAGE and the CMOs, as I've said, they give verbal briefings on TV and radio and respond to questions. Whereas for health inequalities, although there have been um, health inequalities task forces, there's no COBRA meetings and the CMOs provide annual reports, which might be of interest to us in the public health community, but they're not usually accessed by the general public. And there certainly have been no daily health inequality and in health briefings. And you might well be asking, why does any of this matter? You know, COVID-19 is, you know, potentially going to cause a large number of deaths. Um, well, at the start of pandemic, we didn't know what the impact on mortality could be. The team at Imperial College produced a report with the first modelling predictions of the likely scale of deaths under different scenarios. And these models predicted between 20,000 deaths for fully mitigated, um, bringing all the mitigation measures in to 500 deaths if it was unmitigated and COVID-19 was to just run through the population. And these do sound like huge numbers, but how do they compare with other causes of deaths? And something else that began at the start of the pandemic, and it's currently still practiced for the Scottish Government, is to report the daily number and the cumulative number of COVID-19 deaths. And there are a number of problems with reporting deaths in this way. Cumulative deaths can only increase and also it doesn't take in, oh, sorry, it also doesn't take into account the size of the population like a crude rate would do, more populations or a larger population, more deaths. And also this daily counting doesn't take into account the age structure of the population like an age standardised rate would, elderly population leads to a higher number of deaths. And it doesn't take into account the impacts on different age groups like life expectancy would. So, Again, how do we, that's as decision makers, practitioners and the public, make sense of the, this, these numbers? And 20,000 sounds like a lot, 500,000 sounds like an even, you know, it's an even bigger number. So what this next piece of work does is to calibrate the scale of these modelled mortality um, impacts of COVID-19 using 
um, sort of proper epidemiologic methods. And we calibrate these against um, socially determined causes of death. And we cho chose deaths due to drug poisoning, suicide and inequality really to put the COVID-19 deaths into the context we already know about. So to reduce these deaths require a similar multi-agency response as with COVID. And by multi-agency, I mean, obviously they require the upstream large scale population level policies. We need welfare, we need education, we need employment policies to tackle these social determinants. And for COVID-19, I've already said that was physical distancing, work at home. And for those that can't work at home, those that can't work at home, the government brought in various schemes to make sure that people were compensated. We used the predicted COVID-19 deaths from the Imperial College model that we produced in March 2020 because these are the ones that were used by SAGE and the UK government um, to make their policy decisions. And as I said, we also looked at deaths due to suicide, drug poisoning and inequality. And the way that we considered inequality is about fairness. So a fair way to consider inequality is to imagine that everyone should have the opportunity or the death rate of the least deprived tenth of the population. So we then um, defined inequality related deaths as those deaths in excess of the rate of mortality in the least deprived tenth of the population. So you can see um, this graph here has quintiles, not deciles, but it was just easier to illustrate. So um, the least deprived has a death rate here. So any deaths above this line is counted as deaths due to inequality. And we calculated the impact on life expectancy for each of these causes for the UK as a whole and also for Scotland. <laughs> now, after just saying that crude numbers are problematic, I'm actually going to show them here just um, so that, because these are how they're reported currently, and also um, I did show the 20,000 and the 500,000 um, predicted deaths from COVID to try and put them into a bit of context. So again, these are the projected deaths that the government were using to justify the strategies. And you can see that the unmitigated COVID-19 deaths is by far the largest out of all the causes, resulting in just over 500,000 deaths for the UK and 42,500 for Scotland. But deaths due to inequality are much higher than the fully mitigated COVID-19 deaths. So the fully mitig mitigated COVID deaths for the UK is just over 20,000, but inequality-related deaths is nearly 150,000. And here's the impact on life expectancy in years for each of the causes. An unmitigated COVID-19 pandemic will reduce life expectancy by nearly six years in the UK and just over five years in Scotland. For the other causes, it's between a quarter and a third of a year, so between three and four months, which is still quite a significant impact on life expectancy. And deaths due to inequalities impact on life expectancy causes a reduction of three and a half years in the UK and 4.7 years in Scotland. So the modelled unmitigated COVID deaths would have, a, would have had a big impact on life expectancy had um, the pandemic just gone through the population with any, without any mitigation measures. But we hope that this is a one-off or certainly a rare event, whereas on the other hand, deaths due to inequalities happen every year. And these deaths quite quickly overtake the impacts of the unmitigated COVID-19 deaths. So just to put these three and a half years for inequalities into perspective, because these deaths occur every year, over a 10 year period, if there are around six unmitigated pandemics on the scale of the current COVID pandemic, the impact on life expectancy would be less than that of inequalities. So I'm just going to say that again. Over a decade, the impact on life expectancy from inequality related mortality is equivalent to six unmitigated COVID-19 epidemics. And the reason that the contrasting um, the response of governments to these different health problems, you know, is concerning is it's because this differential reaction shapes the media coverage, which in turn shapes the public's understanding and the potential for future effective action. I, mean, I would argue that the policy response does need to match the scale of the problem. COVID-19 has shown that population health matters to people, that's to governments and also to the public. And the government can respond to the challenge with the multi-agency approach. 
Inequalities in health and mortality are a result of the social determinants of health and the unequal distribution of them across the population. So they re also require these upstream large scale population level policies. We need welfare, we need education, we need employment policies to tackle these social determinants. And despite political and public support for these types of policies, it seems they choose not to implement them to reduce health inequalities. So really, what can we in public health, whether we work in research, policy or practice, do? Is there anything that we can learn from COVID-19? Well, we can keep the mantra, follow the science. Public health needs to keep on pushing the agenda and not allow health inequalities to be ignored. It is hard to tackle, but a wise man once told me just because something is difficult doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Something else that kind of occurred to me is do we need a new exciting name for health inequalities? We had COVID-19, how about Inequal 2020? And really, if the political and policy action was to be taken in proportion to the impact on mortality, then comprehensive action on health inequalities should at least be prioritised to the same extent as the COVID-19 pandemic. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the data providers and collaborators um, with this work. Thank you. And just some additional resources from SPHSU for if anyone's interested in reading these. Thanks very much, Ruth. That, um, that was really interesting. Uh, such stark comparisons and just so important that these sorts of comparisons are made and, and highlighted. Um, so um, if everyone would like to please put questions in the Q&A, uh, I'm now going to open up uh, the Q&A and I'm going to start, give people a chance to ask, to put some questions in for Ruth. I'm going to start with, with you, David, uh, and there's a question around um, what, to what extent do you think the mortality increases we're seeing are now a, a result of modern austerity or historical economic and social crises and the impacts of which have accumulated over the life course? So that's a question from Lisa Garnham and I wondered what your thoughts were on that. Uh, thanks Lisa. Could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear the first bit, sorry. Uh, to what extent do you think the mortality increases we're seeing now are a result of modern austerity or result of a historical economic and social crises? Well, it's um, so the long term trends, as a lot of you will know, are not good in terms of widening inequalities. But inequalities have been widening generally prior to the most recent period because although the health has, imp has improved across the population, it's improved faster for the more affluent. But what's happened more recently, as I've, as I've tried to show, is that inequalities have widened because mortality rates are actually going up among the poorest. So it's a change in the nature of inequalities that's the important thing here. And that change has been driven by austerity. As I said, you know, we, we've not looked at causality in this study, but there's so much of the research evidence that is pointing to austerity as the driver of this. So the long term trend is about all the um, historical political factors that have driven inequalities in the UK and in Scotland. But there's been an additional major effect of the most recent years of austerity, which you see pretty clearly in the data. Thanks, David. Um, there's a question for Ruth. Um, Ruth, is it fair to compare the crude death rates now between COVID mitigated inequalities, given that um, the long COVID impact is, is it such an unknown and mainly to deaths later? So that's a, a question on that on an anonymous attendee. <laughs> um, I wasn't actually comparing actual COVID deaths, what we were comparing was the, um, the model deaths. So these were the, the deaths, the death rates or the number of deaths that the government were using to take the action. So um, in March, in February and March, the Imperial College model said if you let the COVID run through it's going to be 500,000 deaths. If you um, um, put some mitigation strategies, introduce policies, mitigation strategies, then it could be as low as 20,000 deaths. So I was just comparing, contrasting that. So when the government realised that they could, they had, could have 500,000 deaths on their hands, they immediately, or 62 days it took them to spring into action. Some people would argue that wasn't fast enough. Um, so I was comparing that, whereas we know inequality deaths um, and certainly premature, the paper in the Lancet showed that these are premature deaths, so not all deaths. Um, that was uh, nearly 900,000 deaths over 13 years. So you know, it is known about, you can compare, I think you can compare the two, 
you know, the, the number of deaths that are occurring before policies are coming in place or policies could come in place are similar. And Ruth, there's another angle to this, isn't there, which is the due to the um, mitigations that were put in place, what the impact of those are going to be, um, irrespective of, um, you know, separate to the COVID deaths. I'm thinking of the, you know, ones in relation to mental, uh, the mental well-being, etc. I don't know if uh, David, you or Ruth want to comment on, on that. I think if anybody was um, tuned in to the last seminar, so Mar Margaret mm -hmm. Douglas, you led the health impact assessment of the unintended consequences of those policy responses, summarised them brilliantly. I won't repeat them here. The, the, there's a recording of the of the, the webinar and the slides are, 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 are on the Scotful website. But yeah, the unintended consequences cut across lots of different areas that are, are, are a major concern. So that's, as you say, another part of the story. Thanks. David, there's a question about whether you started to look at COVID deaths in, um, across the cities in the same way and also across um, inequalities to look at the, whether there's a similar inequalities angle. I mean, we know there's, a, there's an inequalities angle to the COVID deaths, but have you started to compare that? Uh, so I haven't uh, because we don't have those data yet. Um, other people have been looking at, at uh, related issues, but generally and this was kind of the point, the point of showing the data is that the inequalities we're seeing in COVID are a reflection of broader societal inequalities that already exist. Uh, clearly mortality is um, imp impacting people who are already very vulnerable or very ill. Uh, so it's, it's a, an added level of, of, of um, health inequality onto what's already there. That was kind of the point of showing it. And I think when these data are more routinely available, that's exactly what, what we'll see. Yeah, thanks, David. And um, and I suppose leading on to that, another question was what you know what what do you think the impacts going to be now of the diverging trends we saw pre-COVID with the COVID impact on top of that? Um, you know, have you you know is there any modelling or any work that's going on at the moment trying to uh, uh, you know looking at trying to look at the what the likely impacts going to be going forward? Yeah, well, I think it's a similar answer in the. Um we know the areas most affected by COVID mortality and they are, not surprisingly, the poorer areas with high levels of, of, of morb uh, morbidity, etc. So it, it's, it's an additional level on top of that. There is also other aspects around the ethnic inequalities that have been um, discussed quite a lot. But generally speaking, we are in a very unequal society and we see that played out in terms of mortality inequalities generally, health inequalities generally, and this is another layer of that which is affecting very clearly uh, the poorest in society. So as I said before, it's, a, it's another extension to, to existing inequalities in our society. Thanks, David. Ruth, there's a question for you um, from Barry McKenzie. So to what extent is the public support for COVID action driven by a lack of othering perspective, um, a part, you know, a part in the case of the of health inequalities? Um, yeah, that was something that I was kind of like considering too when I was going through the, the contrast but I wasn't I wasn't so clear about the evidence of that but you know so I didn't want to put that in my presentation but I can certainly sort of speculate a bit here and I think you're right there is a an element of we're all in this together it, it can affect us equally we're all equally you know panicking that we can all catch it at the supermarket where it is whereas we don't catch poverty and so you know we're there is that thing of it's poverty is happening to someone else poverty is happening to someone else and so I think, um, who did, did you say who the questioner was? But I think they're right that there probably is this, um, this othering about health inequalities that isn't there for COVID. Yeah, that certainly feels that way from a lot, you know, from a lot of the responses we see, um, uh, both in the, you know, in the press and, um, you know, around and about. Uh, David, Colleen Wilson's asking um, what, you know, looking at the top 10 causes of death, what interventions and measures can we put into place now to mitigate the death rates in those categories? You know, what is other specific from your work, specific areas where we should really focus our efforts? Well, there's a really important point to all this work and also in relation to health inequalities generally, which is we know what to do. Um, so for health inequalities generally, there have been policy reviews going back several years. Diane, your organisation has previous guys uh, laid a review of that looking at the international evidence of what we should do about health inequalities that evidence is all there the in relation to this work um, um other 
work with colleagues led by Rebecca Devine has looked at what the optimal recommendations to address the impacts of austerity are. Um, it's not quite published yet, but it's, uh, you know, recommendations which you kind of know about in relation to addressing the cuts to social security around taxation. So all this stuff is out there. It's not that we don't know what to do. It's, it's, it's the, it requires political will to bring it around. Uh, and part of the problem is in relation to austerity and that, that requires change at UK government level. And for reasons I don't have to spell out, that's quite hard to get that engagement. Um, so again, I, I think it's a really important point that it's not that we don't know what to do. It's tons of evidence in terms of what we have to do. It's about political will at different levels of government that's required. Thanks, David. But I suppose the question is, you know, obviously that's going to be got to be a really big focus of effort. But are there things that people can can be doing, you know, as well as obviously trying to uh, promote that? But are there, you know, are there other things, other specific things that that we feel we could be doing more as a nation, as a Scottish nation? Well, I always worry about these questions about what we, you and I, should be doing. Mm. I think I think it's more about political leadership. It is about political leadership. Mm. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, it's about looking at the evidence, about having responsibility as political leaders and implementing what's required. It's not about what um, people down the road can do. It, you know, the, the, the evidence around the impact of politics on population health is massive. Um, and as I said a minute ago, the, the, the policies that are required to address these issues are all out there and they're all published. Um, so it's about that kind of leadership that's required. And can I also uh, come in here as well? The quote I had from the um, Sally Davies, who is the Chief Medical Officer for um, England, and she recognised that. She said, you know, um, we need to do, you know, Michael Marmot says it's all about poverty, but what am I supposed to do about that? I work in the Department of Health. So she was able to just completely dodge it and say, well, you know, the health service can't do this, the Department of Health can't do this. But then, you know, she herself recognised that, but didn't then take the question or didn't take it any further to say, to improve population health, I need to speak to someone in the Treasury or I need to speak to someone in the Department of Education. She, that's actually, the link's in my talk, you should go and read that, um, that interview it's quite an interesting interview about what she says about austerity and she just dodged all of that work and chose to pick off easy wins for herself yeah thanks ruth and um you know obviously that this work you know a whole as you said david a whole body of work's been published on this um i think you know people know what what the problem is it's how how it's the, you know what how do we how do we get a shift in that and that's what you were saying ruth and question from emma doyle bruce i see you want to answer that that live about you know do we need to stop talking about health inequalities and just change the language um ruth i don't know if you want to come in um, i noticed that um bruce said he would quite like to answer it and i'm happy for him to take it but i think there is you know something i did say about that is the language not right and somebody else had also asked about is it a, like health inequalities is a long-term thing covid is new and exciting and i was trying mm -hmm. to get the language that's used around about it health inequalities is it boring now because we've spent too long talking about it and um i'll stop now and see if bruce wants to come in <laughs> maybe he doesn't <laughs> bruce, did you, you want did you want i don't know if we can come in can you come in bruce <laughs> Sorry. Oh yes, you're there. I, I didn't. I didn't ask a question. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's okay, fine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's uh, David. I don't know if you want to come in on that point, but uh, it's it's what you know. What do we feel as a public health community we can do at this point to, um, you know, to push? Yeah. So push this uh, further. I mentioned the work that. Um, Rebecca Devine was leading on, on recommendations around addressing the most recent inequalities driven by austerity. So it points out the obvious things in terms of, you know, needing the UK government to reverse what it's done. And also a lot of other things around, you know, measures we can use with taxation, etc. But it does also come down to what people in, in the public health community can do about basically advocacy. So again, you know, using what power they have, and, and we all to a different degree have, have levels of power, and influence to try and make these points clear to people with greater power, people with, with uh, you know, the politicians, etc. So, and, and, you know, that 
there's, there's been discussions for decades around, you know, in, you know, a focus on individual health behaviours uh, compared to all the more important evidence around structural factors. So it's about using your own public health to make that clearer, to make the importance of, of political decisions on health clearer. And just to go back to a previous point um, in terms of, you know, individual interventions or particular policies. I finished my presentation talking about the drugs misuse issue and there was this uh, UK parliamentary committee which has looked at all the evidence for that and they've come out with um, a very appropriate set of recommendations about what should be done uh, around um, you know announcing this as a public health emergency around uh, elements of decriminalisation about safe treatment rooms etc 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 and that's kind of been ignored by the UK government. So that kind of captures quite a lot of that in terms of that the evidence is there, the recommendations are there, we, need to, we, need, we know what we need to do, but it requires that element of, of political will to get it done. And I think, as I say, that, that kind of captures some of these issues quite well. Thanks, David. Thanks. Um, very, very interesting set of presentations. And I think in the Q&A just there, we really captured um, what the key issues are going forward um, on that. I'd just like to uh, thank David and Ruth very much for those presentations and for all the work um, they're doing on this. This is such an important uh, topic. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, the next webinar uh, is on the 1st of October at 10 a.m. and that will focus on building forward from COVID and the details are on the SCOTFO and the GCPH website. So I hope to see um, a lot of you there. Um, as well as thanking Ruth and David, I also want to thank uh, Carol Ferguson and Jane Parkinson who helped put the programme together for this series of seminars and thanks to all of you for attending um, and we'll be in touch with the, all the information on the presentations and, and the recording uh, quite soon in due course. So thank you everyone. Bye.